period of history are you particularly interested in? Um, well, funny enough, the year that this is shot is the year I was born, so it's a slight personal interest. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I found before this, this novel existed, um, it was one of the last big secrets of the war, and nobody really talked about it until the end of the 70s, beginning of the 80s. So um, I found that whole thing interesting because it came out rather late, and I'd, I'd never heard of it until the books came out. And um, so I found it the whole thing rather fascinating. Understand that you, you own an Enigma machine. I do. I bought after I'd optioned the book. I bought one in it. One came up in a in an auction at Sotheby's or somewhere like that, and I bought one somewhere being used in the production. Does that mean that you understand the workings? Oh, that, <laughs> everyone claims to understand how they work. Tom Stoppard sort of showed me a few times, and I've been up to the museum at Bletchley Park, and it's like it's all very simple when someone's standing there. But you, then when someone says to me, "Okay, now you explain to somebody else," it's really difficult to um, to, to to remember exactly how it works. It's not that complicated. Complicated to break the codes, I should think. Uh, what is it about the book that you thought would make a, a good movie? Well. I think there are, there's several things. First, there's the ba the fantastic, the interesting background of it, all the code breaking, all this going on, all this whole secret that was kept for 30, 40 years, or whatever. And then on top of all that, um, there was the the thriller thing of it, the, and the love story. So you've got the, several, you know, these two stories going on at the same time. So he has to solve the the mystery of the of the missing girl, and he has to solve the the breaking of the code for the U-boats and um, keep his sanity at the same time, so it's kind of <laughs> tall order, really. How important were those code breakers to the war effort? Well, some people think that without the, the code breaking, perhaps that England would have be, you know, been cut off from supplies from America and, and, I, and had such, Britain had such slender resources that this particular one was a real as fantastic help, and it was a help in the North African War and all this sort of thing. In the early days before, there was a tremendous amount of American manpower going on, so it was. I think it was really very key. Um, in some ways, I suppose Bletchley Park could be seen as a sort of birthplace of the modern computers and computer hackers. In a way, would you would you say that's the case? Yeah, I mean, it was definitely one of the birthplaces of the computer. Um, I mean, the people that work in their famous people now that are really well known. Alan, Alan Turing's perhaps the most famous one, but obviously it was a huge team. Um, they built one of the first real computers called Colossus, which they've just rebuilt a, a, a replica. Um, that's considered, there's one in America, there's sort of a, an argument about which was first. But they, they, I mean, they were both at the same time. And um, they were definitely some of the first computers. Um, what happened to the British one is that they, they just, junked it at the end of the war because it was so secret because it was never used in a business sense which it should really have been but um, they definitely was the first um, computers as we know them now and when, you, when you take a book like, like Robert Harris's book what were the elements that you thought were important to bring to the forefront um, of, of the film the relationships really the relationships between the, the three main characters, the, the things that you have to try you, you you can't do all all the the the, um, the background stuff as much as you would have liked. You can't do as much as the uh, U-boat stuff as much as I would have liked. Um, so what you do is you bring the relationships and the tri the triangle between them um, to the fore and get the human aspects of those and bring them out. How does it feel to be finally making it after a long process? Of it feels fantastic, actually. It's a real, it really feels great because it, there's always times when you think the whole thing's going to fall to pieces because you get, um, you get a director and then the director goes to do something else and then you know that could fall to pieces and then you get an actor or an actress and you know that could, and it's just juggling, 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 juggling and, you, and if one of those elements falls out at the wrong time you could lose the whole thing. So it's a great feeling to actually be there doing it. Just briefly, um, you were talking about casting and your director, just tell me who's directing it and what he brings to the project. Um, the director of the movie is uh, Michael Apted, and uh, he's um, a very experienced director, and both in documentaries and in making features, and also someone that understands all this process, um, and 
very much part of the history of it. it didn't have to do that and there's a really good eye in it for narrative telling a story which is what this is and for getting inside the minds of the characters what a very impressive um, core of actors as well mm. your key characters how difficult were those parts to cast very difficult because there's very few there's very few um i felt there's very few actors and actresses and um that we i was totally prepared to entertain anyone I didn't care if they were polish or american or Australian, whatever, it doesn't really matter to me. Everyone said they've got to be British, so they don't have to be British, they have to appear to be British. Um, and, you know, the, the the leading actor has to, he was, you know, he's a very bright guy, so you have to, it's very hard to act being very, you know, you have to, you're either coming into the room looking like you understand all this or you're not. And um, I think that he really worked out very well for the part. And then at the last minute we got, um, Kate Winsett for the part and she interprets Tom Stoppard's writing I think brilliantly not only does she do that but she adds something what wasn't even written in the way that she does this particular role of a intelligent woman underused um, perhaps her brain underused but you know going and going through and um, this whole war effort and um, in the process falling in love with this guy and then um, Saffron Burrows being the rather vampy kind of spy and the figure, is she or is she, we don't really know. And Jagged Film, um, what, what sort of projects are you, are you interested in doing? Well, I'm really interested in doing any kind of film as long as it's um, got some intelligence behind it. I don't really want to do anything that's kind of mindless. It doesn't have to be small or it doesn't have to be arty, but I do want to do things that will make you think. And, and um, when, the, when the film is finally finished, what do you think will be the appeal to an audience? Um, there'd be, I think there's lots of levels of appeal. I mean, it's a love story, so anyone that's interested in those, I mean, and everyone's interested in those kind of things. Um, and also, it's a, you know, it's, it, it, you can look, you can look at it also from the historical point of view, or, an, or just appeal to someone that's just um, interested in who done it. So it's got different levels of appeal.